Happy Sabbath. I am super excited today because of this message. Uh, I already know what many of you are already thinking. Um, but I want to let you know today is not only a special day because it is the Sabbath. It is a special day because today is your day. I want you to put a one in that chat if you are ready for this message today. All right. Let's, let's get to it. Let's serve the meal. Heavenly Father, bless us, Lord, as we open your word. Lord, today is a day that you have an appointment with those that are watching. Please, Lord, speak to them is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message they understood the mission. They understood the mission. So today I want to start off by talking to you about, about exercise. And you might wonder, but well, Pastor, what does all this have to do with exercise? Um, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. I want to talk about a particular type of exercise today, and that is cardio, cardio. Now, I'm going to ask for you to put the comments in the chat. What do you think cardio is good for? Why is cardio good for you? All right, I'm looking in the chat to see your response. Why is cardio good for you? What does cardio doing cardio, how does it benefit you? Very good, Diana. It, it benefits the heart. And that's why they call it cardio for the heart. And one of the best exercises for cardio is running. How many of you run? Put a one in the chat if you run, if that's a regular form of exercise for you. Um, put a two in the chat if you hate running, because some people don't like to run. But today, I'm going to encourage you to start running. I'm going to encourage you to start getting cardio. Why? Because cardio is good for the heart. Now, now, I want you to follow because we're going to go to the screen and I'm going to show you uh, what I'm talking about here. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12 and verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. So what I want you to understand is the reason that we need to do cardio is because cardio strengthens the heart. And the reason we as Christians need a strong heart is, is because the Bible says that we ought to love God with all our hearts. So if you would like a stronger heart, I want you to put a five in the chat. I want a stronger heart, Pastor. I want a heart that loves God. I want a heart that, that, that is healthy and strong so that, so that I can love the Lord thy God with all my might. All right, good. So you're saying, yes, Pastor, we need strong hearts. One of the best forms of cardio is running. <clears throat> running. So we need to start running. Well, well, Pastor, how do I do that? How do I learn how to run? Let's go back to the screen, and I'm going to show you where the Bible talks about running. 
Notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall what, everybody? Come on, y'all. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Let's come back. I'm going to ask you again. How many of you would like to start running? Maybe you were not running before. Maybe you found running to be a burdensome thing. But today you're saying, Lord, help me to start running. I want you to understand that when the text talks about running to and fro, it's talking about doing so in the context of the scripture. Going back and forth in the word of God and gaining an understanding and then going back and forth into the world and bringing that understanding to others. So God needs runners. Come on, y'all. God needs runners. But you got to be in shape if you're going to run. That means you got to start practicing running. You got to start running daily. You got to start running every opportunity you get a chance. You got to run. Run back and forth to and fro in the scriptures and then run to and fro to your neighbors and to your friends and to your families to express and to explain the knowledge that you've gotten, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God needs runners. Now, I want to show you something because the Bible tells us that if we learn how to run really good, something's going to happen. Come with me to the screen again. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31, the Bible says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, let me ask you, how many of you would like to run and not be weary? How many of you would like to walk and not faint? If you want to run and not be weary, if you want to walk and not faint, what do you have to do according to the text? What do you have to do according to the text? Put it in the chat for me. What do you need to do if you desire to run and not be weary, walk and not faint? What does the text say? The text says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Now, why is this significant? Why is God saying, hey, those who know how to run well are also going to fly. They're also going to have wings like eagles. Why is that significant? Because if we put all this together and let's go back to the screen and please notice with me the book of Revelation Chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So God says, listen. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And by the way, these runners will become flyers. <laughs> these runners will get eagle's wings and fly. Now, why do we need to fly? Well, Revelation tells us that John sees an angel symbolically representing God's people having wings, meaning moving with rapidity, covering large spaces of territory, going to and fro with this everlasting gospel. So how many of you want to learn how to fly? Yes, Lord, teach me how to run so that I will not be weary. Teach me how to walk so that I will not be faint. Teach me how to fly. Give me my wings so that I can accomplish the mission that you gave in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. But again, the question comes back, how do we do that? The text says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So listen to me, y'all. Listen carefully. The key is to wait upon the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? 
What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So if that's the key, then I need to learn how to wait upon the Lord. Now, I know what many of you are going to say. You're going to say, well, waiting on the Lord means that I'm standing by and waiting for him, right? Trusting him, waiting to see how he's going to do move in my life and waiting and having patience. But may I suggest another meaning for the text? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. <laughs> they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Wait? What do you mean wait, pastor? Oh, you mean serve? Whoa. You mean God wants us to serve him, to be in service for him? Yes, beloved, they that wait upon the Lord, that serve. What would you like? What may I get you? You see, when we wait upon the Lord, it means we are doing service for him. And when we do service for him on behalf of him, it strengthens the heart. Check out what the book of Daniel says, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32. The Bible says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flattery, speaking of the Antichrist. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Are y'all catching this? <laughs> they shall be strong and do exploits. God is calling for people to serve him. What does that mean? To do exploits, expeditions. Mm. But in order to do these expeditions, you got to know how to run. You got to first learn how to run to and fro in the scriptures. And when you learn how to run to and fro in the scriptures and gain a knowledge of God, then he says, now go out there and run to and fro in the world. Fly. Take my message. Those are the exploits I'm calling you to. And listen, beloved, it's as if God is calling for an army of runners, an army of flyers, an army of missionaries running to and fro, flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. How may I serve you, Lord? See, when we typically hear, they that wait upon the Lord, we're waiting for the Lord to serve us. Oh, Lord, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And I'm not saying that that meaning is incorrect, but I'm simply looking at this from another perspective. They that wait upon the Lord, Lord. How shall I serve you? God is looking for waiters. At your service, Lord, what would you like? What would you like? Now, now, the Bible is full of exploits uh, of, of people doing things uh, 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 on behalf of God. But, but I want to take an example, and this is a military example now. Uh, uh, the, the, this example of, of what the Bible calls David's mighty men. Let's go back into the Bible, and I want to read to you a little bit about this army that David had. The Bible calls them his mighty men. Come with me to the screen, and we're going to go to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, which tells us, Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Y'all know the story, right? God anoints Saul to be the king of Israel, but Saul begins to turn away from him, and so he anoints David, and now David is in the wings waiting to be king. 
And that's why the Bible describes this, this lessening of the armies of Saul, the house of Saul, and this growing of the armies of David. And so the Bible begins to talk about David's army, what the Bible calls his mighty men. And I want you to check out how the Bible describes them. Go again with me, Second Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, now, these are they that came to David in Ziklag, while he yet kept close kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, the mighty men, helpers of the war. They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Now, I need y'all to catch this, right? Don't, do you see how this army is described? They can use both the right hand and the, it's kind of like this army wasn't playing around. This army was super like they were skilled in conflict. Come on, let's keep reading. We're going to go back to the screen and, and, and verse first Chronicles chapter 12, verse eight. Speaking of, the, of David's mighty men, it says, and of the Gadites, they separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness, men of might, men of war fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. Now, listen, y'all. Every time I read this, I just wonder, what in the world? Their faces were like the faces of lions? What kind of army is that? We know not literally, it's speaking symbolically, but what kind of army must that have been? What kind of mighty men must these have been to be described in this way? David is in hiding because Saul is trying to kill him, but these mighty men are coming and joining David's army by the day. They're deserting the army of Saul and joining the army of David. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16. And there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David. And watch this. David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If you become peaceably unto me to help me, to help me, to help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you. Mine heart shall be knit unto you. But if you come to betray me to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong in mine hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. Then the spirit came up on Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David. I, please mark these words. Thine are we, David. On, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. Reading on, First Chronicles 12, 21. And they helped David against the band of the rovers, for they were all mighty men of valor and were captains in the host. Verse 22. For that day, for that at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host, like the host of God. Listen, y'all. If y'all are not getting goosebumps about how the Bible is describing this growth of David's army, that they grew and grew and grew until they were like the host of God. This is some kind of army, y'all. Let's keep reading. Verse 23. And these are the numbers of the bands that were ready and armed to war and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul according to the word of the Lord. Such as went forth to battle, expert in war. Look at how they are described, y'all. I'm coming some, I'm going somewhere with this. Expert in war with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank. And they were not what? Double men, they were not of double heart. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Wow. Wow. This army was all out for David. 
And the question is why? Why were these mighty men who apparently were so powerful and so strong and could have conquered, you know, maybe whatever they wanted to, why were they all willing to do this for David? That's the question. That's the question. Come on, y'all. Come back with me. We don't know how many years earlier, but come back with me. Pretend that you're one of these mighty men in David's army. And, and I want you to go back to when you maybe 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. And you know that your dad, your dad is in the military, the Israeli military. And one day your father comes home and he's about to tell you the most amazing story. He's not talking to you, though. He's talking to his wife and he's like, honey, you will never believe what happened today. And you sit up because you're like, man, dad looks like really like blown away. And, and so you begin to listen to this conversation between your dad and your, and your mom. And dad, dad's like, so you know we're in this, this fight, right, with, with, uh, with the Philistines. And the craziest thing happened today. So we've been out there for 40 days and every day Goliath is coming out and he's, you know, cursing our God. And, you know, none of us wanted to go fight him. But then this boy, this little boy named David, not much older, and they turn to you. <laughs> not much older than little Johnny here came to go visit his brothers and he overhears Goliath cursing the Lord and he says, who is this giant? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the God of Israel? And you're sitting there like wondering, well, what's going to happen to this boy? Did they like tell him to be quiet and go away? No, you hear, you hear, you hear that this boy says, I will challenge the giant. I will fight that giant. And now you're like, so am I about to hear about how this boy like died? How he was killed, torn to pieces? But that's not what you hear. What you hear your father tell you is that this little boy refused, <laughs> refused the armor of the king and said, I'm gonna take up five smooth stones from the brook and I'm going to go fight this giant and this little boy puts a stone in his swing and begins to whirl that swing and lets loose the stone and hits the giant dead in the head the giant falls and the boy doesn't run like uh oh I hit him he's going to be mad at me no he doesn't run away from the giant he runs to the giant to Goliath takes his sword and cuts his head off and you are like what? And from that day on, every time your parents come home, they see you in the backyard. <laughs> are y'all with me? They see you in the backyard with your stick because you are going to learn how to fight like David. I want you to imagine that when these young men come to David, they already know the story of what he did. That story inspired them to become warriors. That's why their hearts were knit to David. So now I need to break something down for you. We're going to go back for just a moment. <clears throat> you see, there's a lesson here that we need to understand, y'all. So remember, how was David first brought up on the scene? First, he is introduced as a son watching over his father's flock. A bear and a lion rise up to threaten the flock, and this son of this father defeats the lion and the bear. That's how we are introduced to David. He is watching his father's flock and a threat arises within the flock. In the beginning, we are introduced to David. In the beginning of David's story, he is watching his father's flock. And a threat, a lion, rises up within the flock. And David defeats the lion. That's how we are introduced to the story. 
sometime later, the father sends the son out to go check on his brothers. Come on, y'all. Come on, you guys. The father sends his son. Go down and check on your brothers. When, when David arrives, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Y'all remember that, right? They're like, what are you doing here, David? Why, why have you come? They're mad that David has come. But David comes just in time to face the giant that sends them running. <laughs> and how does David defeat the giant? By, by delivering a deadly blow to the head. By bruising the head. <laughs> ooh, ooh, beloved, beloved, please catch the picture. Way back there in the universe, way back there in the beginning of time, Jesus was watching his father's flock and a threat roll arose in heaven. A lion, no, a dragon, reared his ugly head and Jesus defeated that dragon. Sometime later, after man is created, the father sends his son to go check on his brothers. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Are y'all with me? Nonetheless, despite them rejecting him, Jesus defeats the enemy by giving, by giving him a blow to the head, Genesis 3.15. Now, now, I'm going somewhere with this. Because remember, it is after this. Now, remember what's happening. David, at this point, is not the king of the world. I mean, he's not the king of Israel. No, there's someone else who's the king of Israel. That's Saul. But you remember... Saul, who was once anointed and, and above everybody else in Israel, who once served God, turns away from him. So now Saul is now no longer following the will of God, but he is the reigning king at this time. David is the rightful king. But he is not yet reigning. In fact, David went into hiding so that nobody could see him. <laughs> Come on, y'all. They couldn't lay eyes on him, really. He was, dis he was not yet, he was anointed king, but not yet the king. I need y'all to understand this, beloved. Jesus at the cross dies, is buried, ascends to heaven. He is the rightful king of this world, but he is not yet the king. He is not yet ruling. There is another ruler of this world, and that is Satan himself. But Satan knows that his time is short. Why? Because the king of this world has already been anointed. So David, the, the, the heavenly David, is technically, we might say, in hiding. We can't see him. Now, come on, y'all. Please follow me here. If David is the rightful king of the world, then who are the mighty men that leave the armies of Saul? to join the armies of David. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Who are the mighty men that are going up to say, look, I'm leaving the armies of Saul. I'm joining the army of David because I know that he is the rightful king. I know that he is the one that's going to... Re so our hearts are, the, are set on making him king you are those mighty men we are those mighty men we are those runners we are those waiters we are those walkers we are those flyers listen to what the bible says second timothy 2 verse 3 thou therefore Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So God tells us, listen, I've called you to be a soldier. I have called you into my army. Jesus calls us into his army. Come again with me to the screen. 2 Timothy chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. For, thou, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought of the obedience of Christ and having in a... And and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I need y'all to understand that God calls us not only to be soldiers, but to be mighty soldiers using mighty weapons. So yes, you are to be God's mighty men and God's mighty women. Let's break the characteristics of this army down, y'all, because the Bible says that they were fit for the battle. Luke chapter 9, 6, 2 says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is what? Fit for the kingdom. Beloved, we've got to be fit for the battle. Not only must we be fit for the battle, we must be men of might. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Not only must we be men of might, men of power, we got to have faces like lions, y'all. Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Yes, yes, yes. We've got to be swift as rose. That's how the Bible described these mighty men. We got to be swift as rose. What does that mean? Jude 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We got to be like those rose who won't fall, who are quick on their feet. The Bible says that these were men that were ready and armed to war. Mm. The Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. <clears throat> Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Bible says that they desired their purpose was to turn the kingdom to David. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved, our mission is to turn this kingdom to the Lord. Our mission is to go out to be fit, Micah, powerful, faces as lions, swift as rose, ready and armed, strong in the Lord, armored up, yes, ready to turn this kingdom to, 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 to the heavenly David. And so God says, I need y'all to run. I need you to run to and fro. I need you to run. I need you to fly. I need you to walk. I need you to not faint. I need y'all to serve, to wait upon the Lord. What is it that you want, Lord? What is it that I can, what may I get you, Lord? Think not so much, what can my Lord do for me? I'm not saying don't think that, but think not so much, what can my Lord do for me? Rather think, what can I do for my Lord? What can I do to show my love for the, what can I do to serve you, Jesus? At your service, at your service. Listen, follow me. Come back to the screen. Uh, the Bible says that these were men that under, had understanding of the times. Daniel chapter 9 tells us, or uh, Daniel chapter 12 verse 9 tells us, he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The Bible says that they were not 
of double hearts. They were not double hearted. James 1 8 tells us a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, the Bible says that they could keep rank, meaning that they would not be broken. They kept rank. They kept in line. They moved as a unit. Joel chapter 2 verse 7 tells us the, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march everyone on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. In other words, beloved, we have a mission. Let's not break rank. Let's not go this way and that way and start doing X, Y, and Z. We got a mission. Stay focused on the mission. Now, now, y'all got to see this. Y'all got to see this. Because here's where the sermon begins. <laughs> I'm not going to keep y'all much longer. But yo, here's where the sermon begins. Because you still don't know. You still don't know. You still don't know why this is here. Come on, y'all. Follow me. Follow. Follow. Check this out. So let's go to the screen. Second Samuel chapter 23. The Bible says, these be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tatmanite that sat in the sea. So now the Bible is about to get into things they actually did. Exploits, right? Exploits. Listen, listen. So it says, these be the names of the mighty men uh, whom David had. The Tatmanite that sat in the sea. Chief among the captain, the same was Adino the Ezite, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. All right, y'all. You talk about exploits. 800. Now listen, that's a warrior. Like, I can't even fathom, how do you defeat 800 people by yourself? By yourself. Forget about the rest of the army right now. By yourself. Come on, y'all. Come on, let's go back to the screen. Let's go back to the screen. How about this? And after him, and after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David. And they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistine until his hand was weary. And his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. I mean, how do you fight till your hands just like, man, my hand is just tired now. I'm just tired. Yo, these are some serious mighty men. Come on, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. How about verse 18? And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zer Zeruai, the chief among the three, he lift up his spear against 300 and slew them and had a name among the three. How about verse 20? And Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kazbil, who, done many, who had done many acts, and he slew two lion-like men of Moab, and he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. All right. Come back to the screen for a moment, y'all. So this is, this is like insulting. Those last words, like he slew a lion in the pit in the time of snow, is just pure, it's just insulting. Because I need y'all to understand that the writer makes it seem like, you know, he fought a lion, and on top of that, it was a snowy day. So, you know, it was going to be hard. Now, listen, y'all. I wouldn't fight a lion on a good day when the sun is out shining and everything is nice, the temperature is good. I'm not fighting a lion on a good day. But the Bible says he defeated the lion... <clears throat> on a snowy day as if to tell you how difficult it was you know man my footing I slipped a little bit I got a little cut here but I got them though if it wasn't any snow it wouldn't have been an issue but it was snowing so 
Come on, y'all. Think about these exports. And I, why are you thinking about these exports? I want you to understand what is God calling you to do? This is your day. Because I need you today to understand that God has not called you into the church to warm a pew. He's not called you into the church to sit back and watch others do. And the problem is that in our church, we, we often raise up these Adventist superstars, myself, this pastor, that pastor, the people who have large followings, and we sit back and we say, okay, well, let these guys do it or let these ladies, listen, y'all, that's not, listen. God has not called you to be a spectator. He's called you to be a runner. He's called you to fly. He's called you to fight on a snowy day in a pit, in a pit. He's called you to snatch 800 souls from the hands of the enemy. You, you're sitting in your chair right now at home. You're going, me, pastor? Are you talking to me, me? I'm talking to you, you. As if no one else is watching today, I'm talking to you, you. This is your day. This is the day that God is telling you personally, I need you to start doing exploits on my behalf. Don't look at anybody else. I'm talking to you. Come. Now, I hope y'all sitting down. I hope y'all are sitting down. Because here it is. Y'all ready? Put a one in the chat if y'all ready. Let me take a sip. And put a one in the chat if y'all are ready. <clears throat> Come with me. Notice the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 13. And three of the 30 chiefs went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Raphaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. All right. <laughs> okay. Let me break this down, y'all. So the Bible said David longed. Now, now here's what's going on, right? Bethlehem is not yet in David's possession. And, and the Philistines, it's in their territory. And, and David is one day, imagine it like this. One day he's in his room perhaps, and he's just walking back and forth. And he says, he doesn't tell anybody. He just says, oh, that I could get a drink. from the well of Bethlehem. And what he's actually saying is, I can't wait to, to conquer Bethlehem. I want to conquer Bethlehem. And he's saying almost symbolically, you know, man, when the well is ours, we'll be able to drink from it. So he says, oh, that I could get a drink from the well. Come with me to the screen. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Now, pause for a second. Come back, come back, come back. They understood the mission. I imagine these three mighty men outside of David's room, and David is speaking privately to himself, perhaps out loud. It's my pastoral imagination. And he's just like, oh, I can't wait. Oh, that I could get a drink from that well at Bethlehem. I know the Lord is going to give that territory to us, but oh, 
and the three mighty men overhear it. The Philistine army just, you know, hanging out one day, doing their thing. They're around the well, you know, camped out there for whatever. And uh, they look off in the distance and they see three men. They can't make out who they are. They know that they're not Philistines, but they make out, oh, Roseanne, don't do that to me. Rayanne, don't do that. Don't, don't say the three angels. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that to me. Not now. Not in the middle of a sermon. Not in the middle. Oh, you can't just throw something out there like that and then you can't. <sighs> Why? Why? <laughs> Why? These three mighty men go down. And, and, and the army is watching these men come in. They're like, who are they? Oh, they're, 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 they're Hebrews. They're Israelites. And they start laughing like, oh, we're about to have some fun. And so, I don't know, maybe 10 of them get up with their swords and they go out and the army watches them go out into the distance. And then they see like this engagement and they see 10 men drop. And the three are still coming. Another 20 get up. Wait, wait, what, what, what is this? 20 get up and they go out and, and, they, and they see them off in the distance and 20 men drop and the three are still coming. And now the whole army is up because they're like, what in the world is going on? And these three men begin to fight their way through this army, fighting and, and, and making a path to the well. One of them takes out a flask. <laughs> mm. One of them takes out a flask, dips it into the well, and then they start fighting their way out. Can you imagine what must be going on in the minds of these Philistines? And they bring this water back to David. As you requested, sir. Come back with me to the screen. The Bible says here, and they brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did the three mighty men. Now, I need y'all to understand this, but... Because the mighty men were basically saying, David, listen, what you want, you don't even have to ask twice. You don't even have to ask. We just overheard. We got you, David. They understood the mission. They understood the mission. Now, here's what I need y'all to understand. Come on, we're going to bring this thing home. Watch, follow me here, follow me here. Come back to the screen. You see, Jesus, as he was on the cross, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith. I first. I thirst. Now, I get it. I get it. Jesus was physically thirsty. But, but I just want to take those words in that moment, and I want you to understand that there is something that Jesus is now, even now, and even when then was thirsting for. You see, beloved, Jesus is thirsting for lost souls. I thirst. Oh, oh, that I could get a drink. Oh, that, that my desire, because that's what thirsting is. It's a desire, a longing for something. I thirst. Jesus 
is thirsting for souls. And beloved, we as his mighty men are to know. What is it you want? Oh, you want souls? Be right back. God's calling you to be a waiter. God's calling you to wait on him. Because he's thirsting for lost souls to come to a knowledge of who he is. They <coughs> that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, recruit me as one of your waiters. Recruit me as one of your mighty men, one of your mighty women. Lord, use me. Help me, Lord, to begin to plan out exploits. When I came into this church, I was like, all right, Lord, use me. I gave my ministry a name. I didn't even know what ministries did, but I was like, Loud Cry Ministries. That's the name of my ministry. Well, what do you do? I don't know yet, but I will start doing something. Exploits. I remember my brother and I, one night, one of our very first exploits, we got, we got the addresses of 500 ministers in our community. And one night, we got 500 National Sunday Law books. And one night, we car with the car with the bag of books in the back of the car. And we drove to these places and would sneak out and put a book in the mailbox and run in the car and screech off. <laughs> Exploits. 500 books dropped off at churches. God is saying, my son, my daughter, I've called you to be a mighty man of valor, a mighty woman of valor. This is what I want. I want souls. What are you going to do? So, beloved, I don't know what God is calling you to do, but I know this. God is calling you to do exploits. I need you to understand where there is one this minister and one of that minister. Imagine if there were a hundred or a thousand of those, of those same ministers. You don't need to be a minister, a pastor of a church to do exploits, beloved. You can be a member. You can, it, listen. God is trying to multiply his army. And armies don't sit back and just wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. Armies wait. Too many of us are sitting around waiting instead of waiting. Why is today your special day? Because hopefully many of you will look back to this day and say, this is the day that I realized that God wanted me to be a mighty Christian. I thought that I had to be like Pastor Myers. I had to have a story like Pastor Myers in order to do mighty things for the Lord. But today is a day that I learned I can be mighty in my own home. I can be mighty in my community. I can be mighty to six people. I can bring six people to the Lord, six drinks to the Lord. Every soul is a drink. Because Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he that lets me in, I will come in and sup with you. The Lord is thirsty, y'all. And every soul is a drink for him. So I'm going to make my appeal. And I'm going to tell you something that we're going to start doing here at Living Manor. All right. I want Living Manor to be a school for waiters. That's right. I said it, a training school, a school for waiters, a school to teach you how to wait on the Lord, 
how to do ministry for the Lord. So, so we are going to, we're going to seek to implement this. We're going to seek to implement it so that we begin to train our members on how to do exploits. <clears throat> everybody doesn't have to do the same exploit, but everybody has to do exploits. Because we're not here to wait. We are here to wait. So I'm going to make an appeal to, to today. And the appeal is simple. Lord, use me as a mighty man. Use me as a mighty woman. Teach me the art of waiting. If that's your desire, I'm going to ask you to put that one in the chat. Lord, I need you to teach me how to wait. I need you to teach me how to, how to be bold. I need you to teach me how to serve as a mighty man of valor. Heavenly Father, today's word is to wait upon you. We know, Jesus, that you are thirsting. You are thirsting for souls. Every day you are thirsting for a drink from the hearts of men. Lord, may our hearts be so knitted to yours that we will seek to, to fulfill your thirst. And so, Lord, we ask in a special way today that this day will be our consecration, our inauguration into mighty man, mighty woman ministry. Lord, I pray today that you would speak to every individual who is making this decision today and speak to them on how they are to do their exploits, what they are to do, how they are to do it, Lord. Speak to them and may they move and, may, and take action to bring souls to you. Teach them, Lord, to run to and fro in the scriptures and then to run to and fro in their communities, to run to and fro online, to fly in the midst of heaven, bringing the everlasting gospel. Please, Lord. And when that day comes that you are inaugurated as the king of heaven and earth, we will rejoice with you as they rejoice with David. The, the King Saul of this world will soon be brought to his end. May we desert Saul's army and join yours. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy, your power, and your calling. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I want to invite you to join us on Altar Live for our Afterglow discussion. <coughs> uh, the link is in the chat. And um, may God bless you uh, as you begin your mighty exploits for Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please check out our website at livingmana.church. We are not just here for Sabbath service. We have weekly programming too that covers mental health, physical health, weekly prayer service, financial health, and proving the existence of God. It is our desire that our programming will continue to bless you. Please continue to pray for us as we fulfill God's mission to go into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ.